Somehow, it's already the end of another month again, so that also means that it's time to kind of round up what we've read this month. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. August was a busy month for me. On the one hand, I had loads of work things going on, but then also the semester was finished, so suddenly there was loads of extra time, and I really struggled settling into a new work rhythm and reading rhythm. But I still managed to get some things read, which I'm quite proud of, actually. I started with the All Souls trilogy by Deborah Harkness, specifically the first two books. As it turns out, I don't have the third, which is annoying, uh, because I raced through the first two and then found myself with an All Souls shaped gap in my reading. But I started with A Discovery of Witches, which tells the story of a young witch, Diana finding a manuscript in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where she is a visiting scholar. She's interested in alchemy and the way that alchemy became a science, or maybe how it like formed the beginning point of science. Because even though she's a witch, she doesn't want to be a witch. It has bad connotations for her. There's a lot of tragedy associated with magic for her. So she prefers to cut magic out of her life completely. And she's pretty successful until this manuscript pops up, which admittedly it does on literally page two. It throws everything into a tailspin, and suddenly there's a hunky but scary vampire who becomes more than just a friend. And there's also all kinds of others, witches, vampires, and demons circling around, because the manuscript she's found is not just magical, it is potentially the manuscript that holds answers to everything. I think that's a pretty good introduction to the first book. And then in the second book, which I don't really want to spoil, admittedly they've been out for ages, so maybe it's not really a problem. But in the second book, they travel back in time. That was very fun for me as a medievalist. I would also, just like Diana, get obsessed about the details of medieval life, or in her case, early modern life. And that was quite a fun aspect for me. I will say, These books are pretty dense in the information that they share. There's a lot going on, because Deborah Harkness herself is also a specialist in this time period, as far as I'm aware, and she puts a lot of historical detail and just detail in general into the book. And that makes it a very rich reading experience and makes it really fun. You really dive into this time period with her. But on the other hand, it also can be a little bit overwhelming. My brain hurt. Uh, at the end of Shadow of Night, but in a good way, I would say. So now I'm absolutely desperate to locate a copy of The Book of Life, the third book of the All Souls trilogy. I have actually looked in two different bookstores here in Germany, and I have not yet located them, so I might just have to default to the ebook. I've also looked for the audiobook, but I don't know if you have this as well, but it's very difficult for me to step into an audiobook version after I've read the first two books, because I already have such a strong perception of who these characters are that I now don't want someone else's voice interpolated on top of it. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe that's just me. But yeah, what I very much enjoyed about Shadow of Night as well is the way it deals with this whole vampire idea. Because, you know, we've all read the stories, well, maybe not all of us, but many of us have read the stories of a young girl or a young woman falling in love with a vampire and them just being perfect for each other and there not being any issues because they're like an open book to each other. The great thing with All Souls is that Diana is like in her early to mid 30s. She is an academic, she's got her PhD, somehow she's got tenure, which makes me a bit jealous. Um, I think that's a personal gripe, probably. I would also love tenure for myself and my colleagues. But she is a grown-up woman. She's been living on her own. She has ideas about how she wants her life to be. She's not some kind of naive flower that gets the world kind of opened up to her by this vampire. She's already got quite a lot of knowledge and she's pretty set in herself. And also the books do very much play with this idea of You think you know this man, but 
but he is like hundreds of years old. He has been so many different kinds of people. He has lived in different countries. He's had different names. He's had countless of groups of friends in which he was different than he is with you now. And the book actually doesn't avoid this, which I very much appreciate it. I think more fantasy books, especially with vampires, should make a thing out of the age gap in that way, right? Like, show us that it matters that this person has been living for almost a thousand years. They're a different person than you might think after a first date, and they will be different in different places. And that's probably true for most relationships. But yeah, I adore the All Souls trilogy, even if I haven't read the last one, so admittedly that is key to me actually saying I love the entire trilogy, but I loved A Discovery of Witches, and I loved Shadow of Night. After the All Souls trilogy, or at least the first two books of it, I dove into the Radiant Emperor duology. The first book in that duology, She Who Became the Sun, came out in 2021, and I was absolutely obsessed with it in that summer. It was part of what they called the sapphic trifecta, and I very much enjoyed it. It is just this deep dive into the 1400s in China, but it's got these wuxia elements of romance and action and danger and, and a bit of magic as well. And I was, yeah, obsessed, I think is just the best word for it. She Who Became the Sun tells the story of Zhu, who wants to claim her brother's destiny for herself. She wants to be great. And in order to do that, she claims her brother's identity and moves through life as a man, which has its benefits, but also its drawbacks. That is all against the background of the Han Dynasty, the Yunnan, I think, or the Yuan, who are currently in charge of the Chinese Empire and the Red Turban rebels who are Mandarin and who want to kind of reclaim the empire for the Chinese. And Zhu kind of gets entangled in this and wants to use it as a potential stepping stone towards her great destiny. Along the way, we also meet Ouyang, who is a eunuch who works with the Huns as the general of the Prince of Henan, but he's kind of got these secret motives going on as well. He may just have to figure out what is worth most his friendship with the Prince of Henan, or the honor of his family. So that's kind of what goes on in She Who Became the Sun. And then this month, the second book, He Who Drowned the World, came out. And I want to kind of absolutely avoid spoilers for that. But it was a great book. And I admittedly do have to say, I kind of struggled with it a little bit more than I was expecting. Shelley Parker Chan goes a lot harder <laughs> in the second book. The first book is already quite explicit in some of its uh, violence and sex, but there is just this heaviness to the second book, which is on purpose. It's not like that it's an accident through writing, like, but there is a heaviness to it. All these characters are dealing with such a heavy burden of both destiny and expectations and tragedy in their lives and this kind of overarching question of how much are you willing to sacrifice for your destiny? What is the point of no return? And I think that was really interesting, but it also is quite affecting as a reader, where I was just lying awake in bed being like, oh my god, yes, how far do you go? Can you go back after certain things have happened, or is it over now? Right? Like, once you start out on this path, can you diverge into another path, or are you stuck? Um, so that's quite heavy to read, and there is a lot of, again, explicit kind of sex and violence, and the two are also linked a little bit. The book is also very much about pain and hurt, and about how there's certain comfort in hurt. Uh, so that's not necessarily something every reader will enjoy. So there is definitely something of a content warning to this book, I guess, in that sense. I still loved it. Um, especially towards the end, kind of as everything ramps up and you start seeing how Zhu is affected by all the things around her and how she's really taking them on board and how she's also really coming to terms with her gender identity, her place in the world. Um, yeah, it was it was an epic conclusion and I'm, I'm mildly bereft that the duology is over now. So uh, I'll need to look for something else. But thankfully I did find something else, actually. Because uh, another book I read this month is The Water Outlaws by S.L. Huang. 
which is another kind of wuxia inspired fantasy take except this one is a specific adaptation of an early chinese vernacular text from the middle ages so when I looked into it, the dating of that original text is like a little bit uncertain as everything is with medieval literature. So some scholars say that it came from the 12th or 13th century, but the first manuscript version of it is from the early 16th century. So it's not entirely clear when it was written, but it is about events that took place in, I think, the 11th century. This text is called Wutamajin, and it tells the story of the Liangshan bandits. And uh, these were 108 bandits led by Song Jiang, who were in the Liang Mountain. That's what Liangshan means. And there they kind of rebelled against the emperor a little bit. And SL, or no, not a little bit, they very much rebelled. Um, but Esa Huang adapted this into a kind of gender bent version. So the outlaws all become women, and Liang Shan really becomes this kind of outpost for social outcasts, people who have been judged. And I really just, yeah, it was, I really liked the bandits, even though there's some pretty <laughs> rough characters in there. So the main character of the Water Outlaws is Lin. She is the general arms instructor for the Imperial Guard in the Imperial City, Bianyang. And she, you know, is very much the kind of woman who's like, okay, if I keep my head down and if I work hard, then even though the system is unfair, I will still be rewarded and I will have worked for it. So that is very much what's in the back of her mind. But as some of us know, <laughs> Uh, the system can nonetheless be rigged against you even if you try your best. So she ends up being branded as a criminal and she was sent to a work camp, except she never quite makes it there because she gets rescued by a friend of hers, Lu Da, who is called the Flower Monk and she is part of the Liangshan rebels, our bandits. And she takes her to the mountain and there Lin then has to choose whether she's willing to kind of leave behind this sense of morality and ethics that she had while she worked for the empire and whether she's willing to embrace these bandits who are criminals. There is a little content warning at the beginning of this book written by S.L. Huang, which I did appreciate because there are a couple of, of things which which happen in the book which might just for some readers be a bit like, ooh, specifically cannibalism. That's not for everyone, even though it's not kind of written explicitly. Well, I mean, it is written explicitly, but it's not necessarily meant to to horrify you, if that makes any sense. The book is kind of this fun romp in which violence plays a role because these women are warriors and they're bandits. So they're going to go out and they're going to fight and they're going to whack people with maces or swords. There's going to be blood. There's going to be injuries that they're going to have to heal from and there's going to be battles but it's meant as kind of this almost inspirational entertainment. So even though there is violence and even though there are kind of topics that could be a little taboo, it is meant to kind of entertain rather than horrify. And I was very much entertained. I really liked the story. Um, Lynn was a really interesting character and I liked how she was kind of like torn between on the one hand, um, this kind of idea of justice and that the system must be correct. And on the other hand, realizing even through her own experiences that the system isn't fair and that therefore maybe it also isn't just. And there was an intriguing tension that was at play. There's also Sai's plot, which is actually quite relevant. So more like a second plot line with a friend of Lin's called Lu Yunyi. And she is kind of more of an upper class or elite woman. She has a uh, family wealth, so she has an independent position. And she's very much a bit of like um, <laughs> a part-time seditionist in the sense that her position gives her a, a certain kind of space to have opinions that are a little bit more out there. But once it kind of gets sticky, once she gets drawn in into this imperial business and the opposition against the Liangshan bandits, it becomes very hard for her to figure out where her loyalty lies. And that's also just a very interesting storyline. And I did also very much enjoy that, although my favorites remained the bandits, even if they occasionally ate a human being. 
What was also nice about the Water Bandits is that the main character, Lynn, is in her mid to late 40s. She has two grown up kids. She's a woman who's been training in martial arts for like 30 plus years. So it's not surprising that she's a badass. And she also has quite a reasonable approach to life. This is a woman who's had various experiences and she's not just going to run headlong into certain situations or make overly foolish choices. And as I'm getting older myself, I enjoy reading more fiction about people who are not, you know, just turning 18. Speaking of not wanting to read certain things, I did also have a slightly disappointing reading experience this month, which is always a shame. And it does make me feel bad when I have to say that I didn't enjoy a book, but that's just how things be. This book was The Treatment by Sarah Moorhead. And I was really looking forward to it because the way that the blurb kind of set it up was that this was kind of a dystopian thriller book along the lines of A Clockwork Orange and, you know, that one um, Black Mirror episode, I think it's called White Bear, where a woman kind of wakes up and everyone's staring at her and she gets followed into the woods and she has no idea what's going on. And then by the end, as the viewer, you feel horrible. <laughs> that was what I was expecting because the blurb was telling me that in this book, there is a new society, basically, that's been established where um, there's four tiers of punishment, and the first two tiers are very much about rehabilitation. So if someone commits a crime in the sense of they steal bread, then clearly that means they're not food secure. So then maybe that needs to be addressed. Or um, if someone commits a crime because of a certain mental health issue, then the mental health needs to be addressed. They don't need to be locked up. So those first two tiers are actually really beneficial. And then the third tier is aversion therapy, as we know it from A Clockwork Orange. So someone gets pinned down, injected with, with medicine, and then gets shown some horrible graphic things just so that they never commit a crime again. And then there is a fourth tier called Siberia, and that's just imprisonment for life, as far as we're aware. So that's kind of how the book got sold to me. Like, okay, so here is a book, a dystopian book that's going to really interrogate justice, rehabilitation, imprisonment, the way in which, you know, we as, as the population are maybe complicit in the punishment of these people, um, and this is all going to get told to us through the perspective of Grace, who's a psychologist who works within the system. And she's going to uncover that maybe it's not as just as she thought it was. So I was really looking forward to a read that would go in depth about kind of all those themes, right? And then I got started and it was a really interesting prologue about Grace's childhood. And I was like, okay, so now I understand her motivation for maybe working within the system a little bit better. And then we did get some stuff about that system, but what the book really was is a kind of action thriller. It's it's less about kind of questions about justice and more about Grace trying to come to terms with her own childhood and having to sort of figure out where her loyalty lies, whether that's with her husband, who's a journalist, or with a childhood friend who may or may not be a killer and that could have been interesting if that was what I knew I was going into, but I didn't because that entire backstory does not get mentioned in the blurb. <laughs> so when it started, I was like, okay, so this is maybe extra background. Great. Let's get into, you know, a proper description of how this world works. And when Moorhead does get to the kind of world building, it's really interesting. And a lot of it is kind of very interestingly thought out and I appreciated it. But so much of it is about this emotional backstory to Grace's life. And then also at a certain point, there's an introduction of like some extra characters who are kind of playing a role in the background. And I don't want to spoil things too much, so I'm going to leave that a bit vague. But they just felt like caricatures to me. And they just kind of really drew my focus away. And I spent a lot longer reading the treatment than... I usually would with a, a book like this because it was a slog. <laughs> I really struggled just turning the page, you know, um, and convincing myself to go back to it. And I would get a little depressed uh, after reading because I was like, I'm not enjoying this, but I should read it. And, and I was really trying to figure out why, because it's not like it's a bad book in that sense. I think I just went in with such different expectations that when I then met the book itself, I was like, well, this is not what I signed up for. What is this? And yeah, 
And that just, yeah, that really just doesn't set your reader up for a good experience. So when I submitted my review to the publisher as well, I was kind of, I kind of made clear that like my rating is low because I gave it two stars on Goodreads and Storygraph. And I was like, my rating is low, especially for me. But this is just not what I was expecting. And if it had been clear from the outset what it was, I either maybe wouldn't have picked it up or I would have known what to expect and then I would have enjoyed it more for what it is. But yeah, that was a little bit disappointing. I think for those who are into kind of dystopian crime action books, who kind of want to see more action, this could still be a really interesting book. It just wasn't what I wanted. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you can't always get what you want, but it, it would be nice to sometimes get what I want. I did get one thing I wanted this month uh, without realizing it because I, I am not up to date with most things, but my favorite narrative podcast brought its third season out. Now, this is not technically a book, but it is a story, so I feel like it counts and that's why I'm including it. This podcast is The Silt Versus and its third season it started a week and a half ago and the second episode of the third season actually comes out today. The Silt Verses is kind of a horror folk podcast, which I think takes place in kind of a slightly alternative Northern America. Uh, and it's a Northern America in which gods are real. And there's all kinds of different gods and they all have their own faiths. And some of these are licensed and others are unlicensed. So for example, there is a god of like good coffee and there is a god of trains being on time. And all of these gods require sacrifices. And that's where the horror aspect comes in, because all of these sacrifices are quite explicit, but like in a beautiful body horror way. But the Sealed Verses follows two disciples of the Trawler Man, the god of tide and flesh, who is a river god, and he is not licensed. So uh, they're kind of criminals just by being part of this faith. And those two main characters are Carpenter, voiced by Maeve the Brune, and Faulkner, voiced by Binar. And uh, the entire podcast, by the way, is written by John Ware, and it's produced by Mona Hussen. And it's just a brilliant narrative podcast. The audio production is really good. The voice acting is really good. The way it kind of plays with different kind of folk tale motifs and horror motifs, especially the body horror, but also just sometimes the horror of being known. It's just, it's really gripping. And in the first season, the kind of main plot arc is that Faulkner and Carpenter are on a mission from the faith. They're looking for signs and they're looking for maybe other disciples and in the end they potentially find a certain mark from their god which could allow them to fight back. Along the way they meet another woman called Paige who they kind of kidnap but who turns out to then just become a friend really because Carpenter and Faulkner are horrible <laughs> kidnappers <laughs> um, but they also get entangled with the law and then in the second season this kind of expands and the kind of loyalties and alliances that got built up really get tested and the whole world of these different gods just expands and there's such gripping episodes and it's so beautifully done some of the episodes also like I'm pretty good with horror like I enjoy it, I get something out of it, and I'm usually not super scared, but there were some episodes, one for each season so far, where I was like, nope, I'm only listening to this when the sun is up. So that kind of gives an indication, I hope, that it's really good. Yeah, it's just something you can really sink into. It's just a whole world that you get to explore through this podcast. If you're not turned off by body horror, if you're uh, willing to kind of give that a go, I absolutely would just recommend looking up The Silt Verses. It's produced by the same team as IMSQ, and I listened to it on Spotify, and I think you should be able to find it uh, everywhere where podcasts are played, except maybe here on YouTube. So yeah, that's a full-on recommendation, and the fact that that podcast came out kind of saved me from the mild reading slump I was going into. And that's really it for the fiction I read this month. I did also dive into two non-fiction books as part of my kind of PhD reading, the things I'm trying to prepare. Let's see, what were they called? Ah, yeah. It was The Matter of the North, The Rise of Literary Fiction in 13th Century Iceland by Torfi Tolinius, and Medieval Translations and Cultural Discourse, The Movement of Texts in England, France, and Scandinavia by Sifri Katzdottir. Those were two really useful books for me. 
especially because Tolinius in Matter of the North kind of really talks about how kind of social tensions and social development, like as in a sense of how a society and a culture develops, how that gets reflected in, in genres of medieval literature. And then specifically the legendary sagas, like the one I discussed with y'all ages ago, Hof Saga Galtrexuna, for example, a saga like that, how you can discover certain social issues at play. And that's kind of exactly what I'm trying to look into with my thesis as well. So that was really useful. And uh, Sefri Kalsotir is always a good read. She's um, kind of really accessible, even though her writing is quite detailed. And the same is actually true for Tilinius. But in the Medieval Translations and Cultural Discourse book, she kind of looks at how medieval texts got translated in those three different cultures she picks. So, for example, how um, Arthurian romances in France, how they then got moved into England and how they got translated into Anglo-Norman or Middle English texts, but also how they found their way to the Norwegian court. That's just really interesting to see how texts get translated because it kind of plays with the same thing. Like a translation is not word for word. It changes how a text is perceived because it appears in a different language. And then it also brings out different aspects of a story that is relevant for the new audience, right? Like medieval France would have cared about different things than medieval Norway. They're different cultures. They have different ideas of how people behave and what a good story is and how you tell a story. So all these things get changed. And rather than that meaning the translation is worse than the original, it just means it's a different text and it should be kind of seen on an equal level. So I found that super interesting. And of course, if you're not entirely into Old Norse literature, then maybe they don't feel super relevant. But if you have an interest, I think you can definitely give them a go. Yeah, I would say go for it. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, Feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central. Thank you.